Well, hey, we are in week one of a brand new series called You Asked For It. And you know, many times when Jesus would teach, he was just responding to questions that people had. And back at Easter, we gave a survey out and we asked you, man, what are some topics that you would love to hear about? And we took some of the top results and we're building a sermon series around that. And what we're going to kick it off with today is answering the question that you asked, how can I be more effective in sharing my faith? And I'm super proud of our church because of all the things that we could hear sermons about, many of them, you know, they benefit us personally. But when you're talking about sharing our our faith, that's not just benefiting me, it's benefiting other people. So I'm super proud that this was one of the top answers. And I believe when we start learning how to share our faith, it's one of the top ways that we can grow spiritually. So, you know, kicking this off, Jesus shared this in Mark. It says, Jesus said to his followers, go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone. And when Jesus said this, he was giving a mandate to the church. And here's why. Because there's two kinds of people. Look at this. There's people that need the good news. And there's people that already have the good news. Let me reword it this way. There's people that are lost. And there's people that are found. And if you remember the old hymn, I once was lost and now I'm found. Found people are supposed to help lost people find Jesus. Okay, and so it's a mandate that he gives us. And, you know, Jesus loves the church. He loves Christians. He loves us, but he also loves the lost. And, you know, one time my whole family went to Geauga Lake, and we misplaced a kid. You know, I mean, one of our kids kind of, you know, they kind of got lost. And, um, you know, now we can kind of laugh about it, but it was not funny when it happened. Okay, it was not funny. I mean, we, we kind of got you know, distracted. But here's something that we didn't say. Deb and I didn't look at each other and say, oh, we got another one, no big deal. <laughs> we, we didn't say that. You know, I mean, it's all like we, we got consumed with what was lost. We got distracted in a good way with what was lost. And we do that too, you know, when we misplace our keys and our wallet, what happens? We get consumed with what's lost, can I say that God is consumed by what is lost? God is consumed by what is lost. God loves Christians. He loves when we gather to worship. He loves that, but God is consumed with the lost. It says in his word that he would leave the 99 temporarily to go find that one that is lost. And I'm amazed at how many people are not consumed with what God is consumed with. And I want to be a church, and I even want to be an individual that, that is consumed with what God is consumed with. And I believe it doesn't have to be either or. I believe that it can be both and. I want to be consumed with helping Christians grow, but I also want to be consumed with helping lost people find Jesus. And you know, I'm really thankful for what God is doing in our church and in our community. But I think that we can have a holy discontentment to say, you know what? I'm thankful for what he's doing, but I'm not satisfied. And I'm not okay as long as there's people out in the world going to hell. And I want to be somebody that can be doing something about that. You know, I heard a pastor once say this. Satan wants lost people, but so do we. Whoever wants them most is going to get them. Whoever wants them most. Church, let's want them most. Let's want them more. I want to care more. You know, I believe every second... One soul slips into heaven, one soul slips into an eternity in hell. They say two people pass away every second, two people. And if you just say, well, let's just say half know Christ and half don't, that means every second someone slips into eternity knowing God and someone slips into eternity not knowing him. And I just want to be excited about what God is excited for, and I want to be disappointed over what God is disappointed for. Let me just tell you a funny story that happened this past week. A couple weeks ago, someone in my church, God bless them, they, they told me about this donut store, okay? And you know what? If you know me, you know, like, I love sweets. I love bakery. I love pastry. I love frosting. I just love, you know, bring it on, you know? 
And so they were telling me about this gourmet donut place in Cleveland. And I'm telling you, you know, my birthday, like, is coming up this week. So I'm like, well, maybe I'll go there for my birthday. I couldn't wait. I mean, I couldn't wait. I had to go, like, my mouth was watering. I had to go. So I went up to my wife last week. I'm like, let's drive to Cleveland to get some donuts, okay? And so, like, I'm just, like, focused, man. I'm just driving to Cleveland, like, 35 mile one way just for a donut. Like, that's weird, isn't it? So anyways... We get there, okay, I already checked online. I knew they were supposed to be open, okay. I at least did my homework. I pull in there, I'm like, something doesn't look right. It just, they look closed. I check my, one more time, they're supposed to be open. So I go up to the door, and I'm like, okay, door opens. I walk in, I'm like, where's the donuts? You know, and I'm looking, they have one little measly tray of donuts. I'm like, well, they're bringing more in. That's cool, they're bringing more in. I go up, I'm like, yeah, man, I'm, I drove all the way, man, I drove a long way to get some donuts. She's looking at me, she goes, well, this is all we have left. I'm like, well, what time did you open? Six. It was only 11 in the morning. And I'm like, well, certainly you're bringing some more out, right? She goes, no, when these are gone, we're closed. I'm like, it's 11 in the morning. You're a donut store. You're supposed to close at 8 at night. And she goes, no, when we sell out, we're out. I'm like, no. <laughs> no. I, you don't understand. And you know what? My pleading was not going to change anything. So she goes, do you want some of these plain old cake donuts. I'm like, no. So I, I walked out. I walked out and I was so dejected. I was like a mess. I was a wreck. And I'm just driving home like, like just like I was so upset. And I'm just like lavishing and just dumping all my, my stuff on Deb. Like, I can't believe it, Deb. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. I can't believe it. And you know, the Holy Spirit spoke to me in that time. You know what he said? He goes, Mark, I'm glad you like donuts. But if you would just take a smidgen of that disappointment and just kind of put that towards what I get disappointed about, and that's lost people going to hell. And, and, and I'm like, I got you, God. I got you. Don't get, all, don't get all upset about a donut. And then you know what? When the Cavs won the championship, man, I was like on cloud nine. I'm like, yes. You know? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me then. He goes, man, I'm, I'm, I love that you love sports. And, man, it's great that Cleveland won. But can you just be a little excited about what I'm doing. And I'm like, yes, Lord. And so I just want to keep it in perspective, church. Amen. Just keep it in perspective, what really matters. And so let's get into this today. Look, look at this verse. It says in 2 Corinthians, so we are Christ's ambassadors and God is making his appeal through who? Through us. And what is an ambassador? An ambassador is a representative. So you know what this verse says? We are Christ's representatives here on earth. And guess what? He wants to speak and minister through us. And so what that means is we are God's plan. We're it. There's no plan B. It, there's no plan B. We're it. And so as we're being Christ ambassadors, can I encourage you to avoid two extremes? In your notes, check this out. Two extremes you want to avoid are this. As you're being an ambassador for Christ and representing him, avoid compromise and avoid unattractiveness. What does that mean? Many times when we think we're sharing our faith out in the world, sometimes we, we, we think that we have to compromise. We, we kind of have to, you know, have lower standards and, and have lower values. And can I just say, church, man, keep your standards high. Keep your values high. Can I just, listen to this. You can't make a difference unless you're different. we we got to be different. We've got to remain Christ's followers as we're sharing our faith. We don't have to compromise. But let, sometimes people go to the way other end and they say, well, I, I don't want to compromise. And they're so not trying to compromise, they're just unattractive Christians. They're just unattractive. Like I'm like, what unsaved person would want to hang out with you and want what you have? You know, like, so like, like, look at Jesus' life, man. He was attractive. Like, you know, people that didn't have God and sinners, they were attracted to Jesus. So we don't want to go all the way to the other end and be holier than thou and legalistic and uncompassionate. So we have to learn this balance of I'm not going to compromise, but I'm going to be, you know, real loving and just, you know, be attractive with the gospel of Jesus Christ to people. Look at this next verse in Colossians 4. Paul really starts to tell us how to do this. He says, be wise. 
He doesn't say you have to be loud. He doesn't say you have to be silent. He doesn't even say you have to fight for always being right. You know what he says? Be wise. Just be effective. Be effective in, in sharing. And look at this. In the way you act towards outsiders, make the most of every opportunity. I love this next part. Let your conversation always be full of grace. You know what that means? It means that the Bible is encouraging us to have conversation with people that need the Lord. You know, it's okay to talk to people and build up conversation and, and just, you know, connect with people that, that need God. And it says, always be full of grace. And I love this because, you know, what this means to me is we need to learn how to connect with people before we correct people. You see the difference? Many times we feel like, well, God's called me to go out and change people and I need to correct their behavior. Well, maybe, but you know what? God's called us to, to whatever we do, be full of grace first. Like connect with people first before you feel you have to go around telling them what they're doing wrong. Like we have to still believe that there is a Holy Spirit working in people's life, amen? And we're not it. We're not the Holy Spirit. We're led by the Holy Spirit, but we're not the Holy Spirit. So always be full of grace. And look at this, seasoned with salt. That means, man, when we're presenting Jesus, when we're sharing our faith, make it taste good. Okay, just season it with salt. Your countenance, your smile, you know, what you're saying. Give people hope so that you may know how to answer everyone. And I love this next verse. It says this, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect. So let's talk about how to do that today. Let's give some practical ways that we can share our faith. And you know, let's admit, sharing our faith for some, it might be real easy for you, but most of us, it's pretty hard. It can be kind of intimidating. And so let's, let's take this, what could be a real intimidating subject, and let's just give some practical steps of how we can be a little more effective in doing this thing that we call sharing our faith. So the first one is this. How do I share my faith? Number one, I need to begin by praying for open doors. Pray for those open doors, that God would open doors for me to, to have opportunities to share the good news. Paul says this in Colossians 4. Look at this. He says, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains, and pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. I love this verse because what Paul is saying is if you can get to the place of praying for an open door, that means God is starting to work in your life enough that you're starting to be a little more open to sharing your faith. You might be a little afraid. You might be intimidated. You know, God is not giving you that spirit of fear, though. God's given you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And so, you know what? When you are start praying for opportunities, that means God's working in you. And God wants to use you to share your faith. So it all starts there. And, you know, as I was, reading, as I was going over this week, I, I kind of was reminded of how I have forgotten how to do this. I, I wasn't really doing this. And this week I began praying, God, give me opportunities apart from the platform. Give me opportunities out there. To share my faith as well. And I want those open doors that God has for us. Look at the second one. How can we share our faith? Connect with people. Connect with people. See, once you start praying for open doors, guess what? God's going to do his part, but we have to do our part. And one thing we can do is we can begin being intentional with connecting with the people that are right around us on an everyday basis. Like the people at the grocery store, restaurants, our neighbors, right there in our family. Friends, we can connect with people personally, electronically, online, but, but that, you know, we can share our faith by just beginning to connect with people in a relational way. And, you know, that's what Jesus did. Jesus connected with people. You know, Jesus was God, and, and you see him all throughout Scripture just just. You know, before he would say something to somebody that they really need, he would just connect with them first out of that love. And we see this great story in the, the book of Luke that I want to bring to you today. And it's in Luke 19, it's the story of Zacchaeus. And it says, Jesus entered Jericho, and watch this, he was passing through. 
You know, I never noticed this until this week, but I never noticed these two words that Jesus was just passing through Jericho. You know what that tells me? He wasn't planning on stopping. He was passing through the city. Can I say that happens to me a lot? I bet you it happens to you. Listen, I have an agenda when I get up in the day. I have a to-do list. I'm going to get it done. I'm going to go in and out of the store. Don't interrupt me. I got stuff to do, right? Come on, I know I'm telling on some of you, right? Right? You're just passing through the store. You're just passing through the coffee shop, man. You, you got to get to the next destination. And that's what the Bible says Jesus was doing. Jesus was passing through, but watch what happens. An open door happens, and he takes it. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Now, back in the day, people didn't like tax collectors. They kind of cheated people, and they, 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 they were people that really needed God, okay? So it goes on to say that he, or Zacchaeus, wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, look at that, the spot, that open door, remember? He prayed for open doors. That was the open door. When he came to that spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Can I just tell you in layman's terms what Jesus said? Dude, man, we got to do lunch. We, let, let's, can, let, let's do coffee. You know, pray for an open door. God gives you that open door. Now it's a chance for us to be intentional on connecting. Hey, man, let's get together. And that's what Jesus was doing, man, a divine interruption. He was just passing through, but he took advantage of it. And he connected with Zacchaeus on a relational basis. And you know what? When Zacchaeus climbed that tree, it says that he just wanted to see who Jesus was. It doesn't say that he wanted to know what Jesus knew. And can I say that people don't care what we know until they know how much we care. And when Jesus stopped to connect with a tax collector who was not very liked, he was proven his love, that he loved him. And he said, let's connect, let's, let's have lunch. Before he told him what he knew, he connected with him. Look at this. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to, I love this word, mutter. <laughs> they began to mutter, you know. So they didn't like that Jesus was hanging out with this, what they call sinner. Look, it says he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. That's how tax collectors were really looked at. They were, they were really frowned upon. And can I say that really this was a compliment because the Bible calls Jesus a friend of sinners. And that's a compliment that Jesus connected with people that needed the good news. And you know what? Let's not be in that camp of people that mutter over people that need Christ. Let's do what Jesus did. And it says, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Man, I don't know what they talked about at that lunch, but it must have been a good lunch because Zacchaeus was ready to change his life. And can I say that some of the people that will connect with, maybe they won't, you know, it might not be that quick, but we still are connecting on a relational basis with people. And then look how the passage ends. It says, Jesus said to him, well, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham and I love this verse. It says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's what Jesus came to do. And so let's connect with people too. You know, I had this one person come up to me and they just wanted to have a conversation before. This was in the past. And, you know, I, I could tell when they were approaching me that they were just kind of aggravated about something. And, you know, and they said, Pastor Mark, I, I don't know about, you know, this seeker-friendly thing. And I don't know about this seeker-sensitive thing. And if you don't know what that means, it's kind of a terminology that some church people, you know, use. But if you don't know what that means, it's when Christians or churches, um, they're just more aware uh, of people that need the Lord. They're, they're, they're more aware of lost people. And they might, you know, just be more intentional to, to uh, connect with them. Okay, they came up and they're like, I don't know about this seeker-friendly, seeker-sensitive thing. I just feel like we're compromising. 
And I said, and I just tried to help them to say, listen, I said, we're never called to compromise, but we are called to be sensitive and friendly to seekers because that's what Jesus did. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And can I just say, I told him, I encouraged him by saying this. I said, what are we supposed to do then? Be mean to them? You know, if we're not, if you're having a problem being friendly, are we to be mean? I said, no, here's a better way. Let's be really friendly to Christians. That's a great idea, isn't it? And let's be really friendly to those that aren't Christians. And let's be really sensitive to Christians. And let's be really sensitive to those that aren't Christians yet. Isn't that a great plan? Let's just be Jesus to people. Well, let's look at the third one. So we pray for open doors. We connect with people. And thirdly, we share our story with people. Man, you have a story. You have a way that God has impacted your life. The Bible says in Matthew, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So we want to get to a place where after we pray for the open door and connect with people that we can start sharing our story, share what God's done to those that, that we're connecting with. You know, that's where the Bible says in Acts, it says, you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. That's kind of where we get the term witnessing, if you ever heard that. I'm going to go out witnessing. Well, that's where we get it. The Bible says, you know, that's what you do when you, you share your faith. But notice what we're called to do. Think of it in a courtroom. You know in a courtroom there's different people. What are they? Well, you have the judge, right, the black robe behind a big desk. And then you have the prosecuting attorney that wants to send you to jail. And then you have the defending attorney that wants to keep you out. And then you have the witness. And can I say that the Bible is calling us that we don't have to be the judge. We don't have to be the prosecuting attorney. We don't have to be the defending attorney. But we're just called to be the witness. To share our side of the story. To share our story how God has done a great thing. In our life. And so that's what we are called to do. You know what? As we're, as we're praying for those opportunities and connecting with people, we'll have ways and times when we can share our story. And sometimes you'll share your story and it's just planting seeds. But sometimes you might get to a place where that person is ready to receive Christ. And I want you to remember these three things when you do that. Remember the question. Remember the big question. You know what that question is? When you're sharing that good news, bring it to a place where you ask them, do you want to receive Christ? Would you like to receive Christ today? You know, they might not know what to do next after they've heard the good news, but then you can help them take that step into salvation by just asking, would you like to receive Christ today? It's kind of what we do every Sunday when after our message. We ask, is there anyone here that would like to receive Christ? And can I just say that many times they'll say no. They're not ready. And can I say, if, if you ever get to a place where someone says no, don't force them. Just keep doing what you've been doing. Keep loving on them. Keep smiling. Keep being their friend. Keep connecting with them. Don't sever the relationship just because they said no. In fact, they need you more than ever. Because they want to see that you're not going to leave them just because they said no. So stick with them. And you know what? If they say yes, then you have to remember the prayer. Remember the prayer. The prayer to help them cross from death to life. The prayer of salvation. And you know how I remember that is I remember this, it's as simple as A, B, C. When I'm praying with somebody, I just remember to lead them in what I believe is a biblical pattern to lead them to Christ. A stands for admit. That we need to admit that we need Christ. That my good works are not going to get me to heaven. doesn't matter how good I am. I have to admit that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. B, I need to believe that what Jesus did on the cross was the sufficient payment of sin for my life. And I believe in what he did was for me. And C stands for confess. That I'm confessing him as my Savior and Lord of my life. And I'm coming to him today. And can I just say... Praying with somebody to receive Christ is one of the single most awesome things you could ever do. If you have ever had the opportunity to do that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
It's greater than any thrill ride. It's greater than any roller coaster. It's greater than any gourmet donut. And if you have never yet had the chance to lead somebody to Jesus, I just want to ask you, perhaps you could pray to say, God, I just want to put this on my bucket list that I would just love someday, maybe you could use me to lead somebody to Jesus Christ. Just pray that. I don't know what to say. Man, God will lead you. God will lead you. He really will. And you just follow these steps. Pray for the open door. Connect with people. Share your story. And if they, you would like to receive Christ, pray the prayer. And then the last one is remember the follow-up. We're not just called to see people decide for Christ. We're called to make disciples. So we have to encourage people to get, get connected with a church family where they're going to grow in their faith. Well, let's look at the fourth one, inviting people to church. We can share our faith simply by inviting people to church where you know they're going to hear the good news, you know they're going to be encouraged, and you know they're going to have a chance to come to Christ. The Bible says this, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. When he got there, he ran across Philip and said, come follow me. Philip went and found Nathanael and told him, hey, we found the one Moses wrote of in the law, the one Preached by the prophets, it's Jesus, Joseph's son, the one from Nazareth. Nathaniel said, Nazareth, you've got to be kidding. But Philip said, well, come see for yourself. You know, sometimes people just, you just invite people and they'll experience it for themselves. When they're in a life-giving atmosphere with other people that have found Christ, and they'll see the goodness of God and have that chance. Well, you know what, let's take the last remaining minutes today I want to give you what I believe is so important, and it's this, that we need to help people have the right perception of God. You know, it is called good news. And do you ever wonder, like, why if it's good news, why do so many people don't want it? Why do people don't want it? They reject good news. Why? I believe most of the time it's because they don't have the correct perception of God. If we can help people have the right perception of God, I believe They would want the Jesus that we know. And you know, even in the Bible, Jesus went up to his disciples and he said, hey, who do people say that I am? And even amongst his disciples that have followed him, they said this, well, some people say you're John the Baptist, some people say you're Elijah. And then he looked at Peter and goes, who do you say I am? He goes, man, you're the Christ. So we know if in Scripture people had different views of God. We know out there in the world People have different perceptions of God. So let me give you four perceptions of God. The first three are not good ones. But look at this. The first perception is this. People see God as a locked gate. A locked gate. Have you ever gone up to a locked door, a locked gate, and you're like, man, I just, I just can't, I can't get in. And you know, you feel far from, you, you feel stopped, you just feel <sighs> apart. And the myth that people believe is this, God cannot be reached. And there's many people out there that believe that God is so far from them. God is so unreachable. And the, you know what the scripture says? It says this, it says in Acts, he doesn't play hide and seek with us. He's not remote, he's near He's not running away from people that need him. He's running to them. He might not condone of their behavior. He might not like what they're doing, but he loves them and he loves their soul. And God is near to those who need him, church. And we have to remind people of that. The second one is this. They see God as a pile of luggage. Pile of luggage. They'll say things like this. I know God forgives, but he can never forgive me. I mean, if you only knew what I have done, you only know what I'm doing, there's no way God would love me enough to forgive me. The myth here is that God doesn't want me. He might want you, or you're spiritual, he doesn't want me. And we have to help people have a right perception of God, that God does want them. No matter what they've done, God wants them. The Bible says this in Romans, it says, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. Look, while we were still sinners, Christ did this. And I just get this picture in my mind. Can you imagine if Jesus was getting nailed to the cross and before they drove the nails in his hand, he goes, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. 
Are any of you guys going to come to me before I go through this agony? I want to know ahead of time. Because I'm not going through this unless there's some results. No, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus died on the cross while we were still sinners. And that's how much he wants us. And we need to help people have that right perception. Thirdly, people see him as an endless ladder. An endless ladder. They say, man, it's just too hard to come to God. There, I got to get all cleaned up first. I have to change my entire life before he, to come to him. You know, there's too many hoops to jump through. Can I say the myth is this? God requires a lot from me. When we're coming to Christ, he does not require a lot. Now, I know the scripture says that faith without works is dead. But that's after we get saved. Once we receive Christ, we are called to do good works. But those good works don't save us. What happened on the cross is what saves us. And we simply have to admit our need for a Savior and ask Jesus into our life. And the Bible says that in Ephesians. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's not all the hoops you jump through. It is a gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. And lastly, here's the true perception of God. It's a free gift. Amen, it's a free gift. That's the true picture, the true perception of God. That's, we want to help people when they see God, when, they, when, they, when they're coming to God, we want to see, we want to help people see that God is offering them a free gift of salvation. And you know what? Everyone in this room that knows Jesus, we were once there. We were once lost. And we always have to remember how far we've come and what Jesus has done in our life, don't we? But there was a point that we realized that we needed a Savior and that God had a free gift of life to give us. And the Bible says this. It says the payment for sin is death, but the gift that God freely gives is everlasting life found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Church, I'm super proud of you. For us to say, I want to, I just want to know more about how to share my faith. And I believe God is speaking to us today on how we can go out these doors. We could be praying for those, God, those divine appointments, those, those open doors that God wants to use in our life. And I just believe he wants us to encourage us to connect with people. And we might not approve of what they're doing. They might not be where they should be, but God's calling us, the found people, the people that have the good news, to connect with people that need him. And maybe he'll lead us to a place where we can have a conversation and share our story and get to a place where we can help people cross from death to life. And I believe he wants to use you. I believe he wants to use us to do that. Do you believe that today?